for several days to see if you're going to wake up. They call that a wake, to see if you're going to wake up. So they bury you, and when they put you into the coffin, they tie a string around your finger, and the coffin goes into the ground. The string comes out of the coffin and goes up onto the land and onto a little stick, like a, like a V-type stick hung over. On the end of the string was a bell. And if you found that you were buried and still alive, all you needed to do was to move your finger. And it would ring the bell. And people would know that you were not dead. And you would have been saved by the bell. <laughs> or a dead ringer. <laughs> I don't make this up. Now, think about this. During the day, there are people in the burial grounds who are there to, I don't know, perhaps pay respects to family or just seek solace or whatever. So during the day, if you ring your bell, somebody's going to hear you. But nobody hangs around a burial ground at night. So they had to hire a special person to sit and listen for the bells at night. And no one wanted to, to work all night long. And that was called the graveyard shift. <laughs> Tell you laugh. I'm, I, make, I don't make it up. No, I'll get that. And <laughs> another one. A little, bit, uh, a little bit different. But in England, if you were to commit a terrible crime, they would behead you. Here they would put you in the stocks and everyone would come throw tomatoes or, or fruit or whatever. But they would cut your head off in England. And you would go and you put yourself in front of the block and you would say your prayer. And before you put your head down for the final time, you would take a coin and give it to the man with the axe. So that his, the blow of the axe would be swift. Because if he misses the first time, it really hurts. And then you've got to do it again. And this money that you gave to the executioner was called severance pay. Talk to your boss about that one. Yes, indeed. These are all things that you, you wonder where, where these phrases come from. And they really were started way back in my day. Now, the soldiers in my day had to, and in fact, I imagine that our Muslim friends over here will probably be able to do the same thing. So, you had to, if you were a soldier with a musket, you had to know every single piece of that musket, every, every bolt, every screw, every part. You had to be able to take your musket apart and put it back together quickly. You had to clean it because they get dirty. You had to clean it. So the, the part of the, uh, of the musket, if you see that long silver part, is called the barrel. All right, that's good. And the wooden part that you put under your arm is called the stock. And in between that, you have all bits and pieces. And that, uh, what, the, the thing that you flick, basically, is called the lock. And you had to know how to take that gun apart and put it back together, lock, stock, and barrel. You had to know the whole thing. Now, if you were to load your musket, and not that you would do this, but incorrectly, you, you pour some powder in, in, into the pan, as it were. Don't do that, please, because we're inside. I don't want to be shooting anyone. But OK, that's it. Anyway, you put, you put your powder in the pan, and you do all your priming and all of that. But if you don't do it correctly, when you pull the trigger, the only thing that happens is the flint will ignite the powder that's in that little dish, that little pan. It won't go in to the musket and fire off the musket ball, and you will have been a flash in the pan. Now, with the musket, when you pull back the hammer, is it called? I would say trigger, or the hammer? We'll call it a hammer for now. If you click it back, it goes into sort of a safety position. But if you click it all the way back, you're ready to fire. So you click it into the safety position, and you take aim, and if you forget to click it that extra time, it doesn't go. It doesn't go. So you are not only a flash in the pan, but do you know what I'm going for? Going off half cocked. Going off half cocked. <laughs> Thank you. Remember, there is a book that's called Lock, Stock, and Barrel, and it's just chock full of all things like of these phrase origins. Uh, one more I'll just give you before I go back. In, in our day, houses had roofs made of thatch, which is like straw with mud, putting it together. And there was often a, a fire inside the house, and the heat would rise up, and it's sort of like a convection. And it would come down, and it would heat up again, and your house would become somewhat warm. And if you had little pets, 
like little field animals or little kitties or whatever, they knew that up on top of the roof was the warmest place to be. So they climb up and they get all snuggly, they sleep on the roof, and lovely, nice and warm, beautiful. But they were sleeping, didn't realize that uh, thatch gets very slippery when it's wet. So if they're up there and it's raining, the thatch gets slippery. Hence, they, they fall off. All right, what's that one? Yes, no. Exactly, that's where it comes from. Now, I didn't make those up. People, they, I'd love to take credit for it, but I think writers would not like that. But th this is just giving you, again, a feeling of, of what the times were like. But again, the times were not always great. Times were very, very difficult. But I think with all of the letters that have been written, and there are just thousands of them, the one I think that I am not most proud of, but that I feel the strongest about is the one I'm going to leave you with right now. I'm going to put these down for a moment. Time was difficult but optimistic, and the Declaration of Independence had been signed. We were going to be a country, and the, didn't know it then, but we did become the greatest country. Here's a letter to John Adams, 21st July, 1776. Last Thursday, I went with the multitude to King Street to hear the proclamation of independence read and proclaimed. Some field pieces were brought there, and the troops appeared under arms, and all the inhabitants were assembled there. When Colonel Crofts read the, from the balcony of the State House, great attention was paid to every word. And as soon as he ended, the cry from the balcony was, God save our American states! And then three cheers rendered the air, the bells rang and the privateers fired, the forts and the batteries, the cannons were discharged, and the platoons followed. Every face appeared joyful. And after dinner, the king's arms were taken down from the state house, and every vestige of him from every place in which it appeared were taken down and burned on King Street. Thus ends... Royal, royal authority in this state. And all the people shall say, Amen.